1924, the Democratic Party needed to pick a presidential nominee to run against Calvin Coolidge, and they knew it was going to be hard. Um, Coolidge was fairly popular. He had become president when Warren Harding keeled over and died in office. Harding's vice president was Coolidge. That's how Coolidge got to be president in the first place. Uh, as president, Coolidge was pretty widely liked. He was overseeing a pretty good economy. He was running basically as an incumbent to try to hold on to that seat. And the Democrats knew that Coolidge was going to be hard to beat in 1924. But the Democrats headed into their convention that year in the hot summer of 1924, intending to pick somebody to run against Coolidge. And they at least felt like they had a couple of good candidates to choose between. Again, this is a time when they chose their nominees not in a primary process so much as just at the convention, at the big meeting of the National Party. So when the Democrats converged in New York City the summer of 1924, they knew they had two frontrunners for the nomination. One was a Democrat named Al Smith, who was very popular. He was the governor of New York at the time. His chief rival for the nomination that year was a guy named... William Gibbs McAdoo. Uh, McAdoo was originally from Tennessee. Uh, he ultimately became a senator from California in the Woodrow Wilson administration. McAdoo was secretary of the treasury and he pulled off the major coup of marrying President Wilson's daughter while Wilson was president and while McAdoo was serving as Secretary of the Treasury. They held the wedding at the White House. It was this big society deal. He was a very high-profile Secretary of the Treasury, to say the least. So McAdoo is the uh, son-in-law of the former president. He himself is a former Treasury Secretary. He is a senator. He's very rich. He's got ties both to the West and to the South. He'd been the vice chairman of the Democratic Party. He was very, very, very well connected. And in fact, the last time Democrats had needed to pick a presidential candidate, four years earlier in 1920, 1920 they very nearly picked McAdoo. In 1920, a lot of Democrats thought that they should have and they might have done better with him in 1920 than with the guy who they ultimately picked who lost. So heading into 1924, Al Smith had a pretty good shot at getting the nomination, but William McAdoo, he was in really good stead as well. And McAdoo had one ace in the hole. He had a secret weapon, which was that he also had the Klan. This is 1924, Ku Klux Klan was absolutely ascendant in that part of the 1920s. Uh, the racist seminal film, Birth of a Nation, that glorified the Klan, that film had come out in 1915 and swept the nation. It had helped revivify the Klan from its old days in the Civil War era and the Reconstruction era. The Klan got even more wind in their sails when they became one of the major powers pushing for prohibition. Uh, looking back on prohibition, it still seems like one of the more unlikely things in American history we ever as a country would have decided, right, to ban alcohol as a country. Really, we decided that? But uh, an, an unsung but important part of why that happened was the Klan supporting prohibition. And by the time the Democratic Party was making this hard choice about who they were going to pick to be their nominee for president in 1924, the Klan thought it should have a say. The Klan was big enough, confident enough, widespread enough in terms of their reach that they really thought that they should get to make the call as to who the Democratic Party would pick for their presidential nominee that year. And again, the, the two strong frontrunners for the nomination that year were that guy William Gibbs McAdoo and Al Smith. And you know what? For the Klan, that was a really easy pick because Al Smith was a Catholic. And the Klan was as anti-Catholic as they were anti-Semitic and anti-black. So they're not going to pick Al Smith. The Klan went all in for William Gibbs McAdoo. And the Klan ended up being absolutely central to the fight for the presidential nomination that year. An anti-McAdoo delegate from Alabama, of all places, put forward a plank for the party platform that year that would have condemned the Klan, denounced the Klan. The fight over whether or not to approve that anti-Klan plank for the party platform absolutely convulsed the convention that summer. They were literally fighting in the aisles. They at one point called in a thousand policemen to break up the brawling on the floor of the convention. Ultimately, the anti-Klan plank in the party platform, it was voted down. It was voted down by one vote. 
Uh, Politico.com did a retro report on this a little bit more than a year ago, and they surfaced this old headline from the contemporaneous coverage. This, as you can see, it's the Baltimore Sun. anti clan plank loses by 541 and 3 twentieths of a vote to 542 and 3 twentieths of a vote. Riotous scenes marked the roll call. And you see just below that's a little blurry, but you can see it there. Bedlam over the Klan. Second poll is required to settle the question on this Klan question. And then actually in the little chart there in the third column, it's the list of all the people at the convention and who voted how on the Klan plank. It was that big a deal. Failed by one vote. And when the anti-Klan, so the, the pro-Klan side won, right? When, when the anti-Klan plank lost by that one vote, 20,000 masked, hooded Klansmen rallied across the Hudson River in New Jersey to mark the moment. They didn't think they'd be able to rally in New York City, not with their robes and their masks. So they crossed over to New Jersey and they showed force, 20,000 of them. They had an effigy of New York Governor Al Smith, that Catholic. They had an effigy of Al Smith at their rally and they beat it up and tore it apart. But then the convention had to move on to picking its nominee. Right? You're going to pick the Klan candidate? The candidate who was clearly favored by the Klan, who wouldn't denounce them, who wouldn't say a word against them at a convention that couldn't approve an anti-Klan plank? Or are you going to pick the Catholic guy, the Catholic governor of New York, Al Smith? I mean, if that's the split in your party, how do you bridge that kind of split? For the Democratic Party that year, in 1924, they couldn't bridge it. They, they started balloting, they started taking votes on who the delegates wanted to be their nominee, and honestly, they couldn't get there, and they couldn't get there, and they couldn't get there. That convention dragged on and on and on in the July heat in Madison Square Garden. That thing went on for 16 days with thousands of people in there and no air conditioning, and the fights and the cops, and they kept going, ballot after ballot after ballot. Famously, that one ultimately went to 103 ballots. A record. And in the end, they couldn't decide. The Democrats finally, in the end, exhausted. They picked neither of their two candidates. They did not pick William McAdoo, nor did they pick Al Smith. They couldn't figure it out. They ended up just throwing in the towel. They picked some other guy named John Davis, who nobody knew and basically had no constituency. They were absolutely spent from their fight with the Klan and over the Klan that summer in New York. They ran this guy, John Davis, half-heartedly. He got trounced. Coolidge won the election. Coolidge was sworn in in March of 1925. And the Klan, having flexed its muscles that way in national politics in the lead up to that election, yeah, Coolidge wasn't their guy. They wanted a Democrat in there. But they decided that once Coolidge was in there, it was time for them to make another show of political power. And this time they didn't just want to make it within one political party, particular, polit particularly a political party out of power. This time they wanted to flex their muscles on the national stage. This picture is from August 1925. So this is during the first year of Calvin Coolidge's presidency after the election in 1924. Michael Beschloss tweeted this out today. And those aren't like choir robes, right? Those are Klan robes, the Ku Klux Klan marching in full white hoods and robes down Pennsylvania Avenue, right through the heart of Washington, D.C. That was their show of national force in 1925. And then a year later, they decided to come back and do it again, but this time even bigger. In the fall of 1926, September 1926, the Ku Klux Klan held what they called their conclave, their national conclave in Washington, D.C. Second time they rallied thousands strong in D.C. in two straight years. When they turned up in 26, 1926, they turned out 50,000 masked, robed Klansmen who marched in formation through Washington, D.C. Most of these pictures are from the Library of Congress. No matter how many times I have seen them, no matter how many times I have gone through these pictures, I still have a hard time believing that that show of Klan force in Washington, D.C., I still have a hard time believing it's real. But that was real. That was 1926. 50,000 Klansmen marching in Washington, D.C. The following year, in 1927, there was a Klan rally and march in New York City. It started off with a group of fascists, literally fascists, black shirts, 
um, who clashed with New York City police. And then that melee was joined by about, according to contemporaneous news coverage, by a, a, about a thousand Klansmen who turned out in New York, in Queens, to march against the police. The New York Times published at the time uh, some of the text of the handbills that the, the the flyers that the Klan was distributing at the time, explaining why they were marching, why they were rallying. The headline on the flyer said, Americans assaulted by Roman Catholic police of New York City. That was their explanation for why they had to go march against the police. And so in May, of 1927, a thousand Klansmen and some assorted fascists marched in Queens in New York City and they ultimately rioted and fought with police. Nobody was killed. Uh, there was a lot of news coverage of it at the time, which survives both from the uh, New York Times, from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, from a few other pap papers. The police commissioner at the time made a point of telling the public that this was kind of a landmark moment for the Klan in New York City. It's not that he didn't know that the Klan was active in New York City. It's just that New York City had never before seen a thousand Klansmen turn out in the streets in robes and masks like they did in May 1927. According to news reports at the time, there were seven men who were arrested at that Klan march in New York. One of them was Fred Trump who was the father of Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump has previously responded to reporting about this incident by saying it never happened, never happened, never happened. The whole thing is made up. But there is contemporaneous news coverage that both describes and shows pictures of that mass Klan march, including Klansmen marching in New York City in hoods and robes, and his father's name does show up as one of the arrestees from that march. And the sins of the father are not the sins of the son for anybody. But that is not a reason to ignore history and pretend that everything that's happening in our lifetimes is happening for the first time. I mean, we think of the Klan now in terms of its role as a terrorist organization during Reconstruction, during Jim Crow, during the civil rights eras in the South. We think of the Klan and their attendant modern white supremacist groups as a, a, a magnet for toothless losers and con artists and small-time violent thugs and some people who are just legitimately freaking nuts. But it's not ancient history. It's not even ancient family history to recognize that the white supremacist movement in this country, which persists decade after decade after decade, their goals have never been to just exist on the fringe as some sort of kooky throwback peanut gallery for parolees, right? I mean, their goals and their expectations have always been that they should exert real mainstream political power. That they should get to pick the president. At least they should get to pick who runs. I mean, what is unpredictable now is that we don't know what to expect from those groups going forward now that it's a modern president who appears to be picking them. When you say the alt-right, uh, define alt-right to me. You define it. Go ahead. Well, I'm saying, as no, Senator, define it for me. Come on, let's go. Define Senator it for McCain me. defined them as the same group. Okay, what about the alt-left that came Day. charging at me? Excuse me. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? Not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. Well, what now? Those people were also there because they wanted to protest the taking down of a statue, Robert E. Lee. So, excuse me, and you take a look at some of the groups and you see, and you know it if you were honest reporters, which in many cases you're not, but many of those people were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. So, this week it's Robert E. Lee, I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you, all, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? But they were there to protest. Excuse me. You take a look the night before. They were there to protest the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. The neo-Nazis started person. this. They showed, they showed up in Charlottesville. They showed up in Charlottesville. Excuse me. To protest Excuse me. They didn't put themselves down as neo And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group, excuse me, excuse me, I saw the same pictures as you did. 
You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. You had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. You were saying the press has treated white nationalists unfairly? No. I just understand what you were saying. No. There were people in that rally, and I looked the night before. If you look, there were people protesting very quietly the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. You had a lot of people in that group that were there to innocently protest and very legally protest. After the president's remarks today, uh, praising the white supremacist gathering in Charlottesville, Virginia this weekend, um, this became another one of those days where there was condemnation of the president from uh, Democrats and observers. There was mild condemnation of the president from members of his own political party. Um, it was an interesting thing that happened late this afternoon, early this evening, when some White House officials tried to distance themselves from the president's remarks as well. At least one senior official anonymously telling NBC News that members of the president's team were stunned by the president's words today. This one senior White House official telling reporters, telling NBC News that the president went rogue, that there was no expectation among the White House staff that the president was going to make remarks on this subject as all, as this, on this subject at all. And as much as some White House official might want us to believe that, it's clear that that account is not true. The Associated Press caught this great high-resolution shot of the president folding up notes, clearly about the white supremacist rally, and sticking them into his suit jacket pocket before he started taking questions on this today. The president was not there to talk about infrastructure today. He was obviously intending as well to talk about this matter today. He had prepared to talk about this matter today. White House staff who say that this was completely shocking to them, that he went rogue, he wasn't even supposed to touch this subject. Those members of the White House staff are covering for themselves and inventing something that happened today that makes them look better that is not actually what happened. And this was a lot of things today. It was not apparently a mistake. And at some point, it's going to have to stop being treated as a surprise. I mean, this was not the president accidentally blundering into something that inadvertently sounded like sympathy for people with unpopular political views, right? I mean, this is on purpose. This is what it is meant to be. The president building up and trying to center up in American politics a long-standing force in white American politics and culture that we have been trained to think of as a fringe thing. But it does have a very long history, and it does have real force. The president is not messing up here. He did not trip and accidentally praise white supremacists and neo-Nazis and pro-Confederate demonstrators who actually killed somebody this weekend. This was not a screw-up. What he is building back up is something that was a long-standing force for political power and terror in this country for generations, and he is now doing what he can to help them come back. And partisan affiliations come and go, right? The party having the huge fight over the Klan in 1924 was the party of the Civil Rights Act by 1964. Parties change. Partisan affiliations change. Ideological alliances come and go. Candidates come and go to the point where we can't even remember the names of most presidential candidates not too long down the road in history. But whether you voted for Trump or not, whether you have any partisan affiliation or not, whether your own family has ever lived through the terror that is this persistent, fascistic, violent, racist element of American culture. This persistent, fascistic, violent, racist element in American culture and politics is a real thing that we have lived through before as a country. And it waxes and wanes, but it has never really gone away. And now the president working overtly as president, is doing what he can to bring it back and build it up. And so far, honestly, it's working. Heads up, this is not a mistake. He is not screwing this up. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.